good evening can you all hear me yes sir go uh, ahead sir okay uh, screen sharing I, okay i'll just share my screen yes sir do it okay are you able to see the screen yes sir visible okay i'll just make it to yes sir you can start uh okay thank you very much uh, dr rajesh babu dr burugan and the organizers of uh, the stands uh, cme for having invited me to share our uh, experiences uh, on the management of midline posterior fossa tumors in children so in this talk i shall be uh, talking giving a brief uh, introduction of uh, midline posterior fossa tumors in children which we all know are a very common problem that all of us face in day to day practice and they can be challenging at times to manage so since i will not be able to cover all the aspects of uh, management uh, in the next 15 minutes or so i shall give a brief overview of uh, our experiences in uh, managing these patients with respect to the radiological uh, diagnosis um, in management of hydrocephalus in these uh, children and certain adjuncts that we use during surgery which may help in uh, achieving a maximal safe resection uh, in these uh, children okay so as we all know uh, in this study which has been uh, you know well quoted and well cited uh, published almost uh, 12 years ago in neurology india from various centers in, uh, in the country uh, among pediatric uh, tumors uh, medulloblastoma constitutes almost uh, one quarter of those uh, tumors and ependymomas are about 10% and pilocytic astrocytomas and atrt are the other common midline posterior fossa tumors that are seen uh less commonly seen among uh, children are the fourth ventricular choroid plexus uh, papilloma which is a benign uh, tumor but our my topic today would be mainly focusing on the blind posterior fossa tumors uh, namely medulloblastoma ependymoma and pilocytic astrocytoma now in this uh, retrospective study of uh, 82 children uh, with midline posterior fossa tumors performed from our uh, institution Uh, and published in 2021 uh, we found that uh, medulloblastoma is accounted for nearly 50% of all midline posterior fossa tumors in uh, children and pilocytic astrocytoma came second with almost 40% of the children having pilocytic astrocytoma and about 12% having ependymoma so ependymoma is relatively seem to be less common compared to medulloblastoma and pilocytic astrocytoma among the midline posterior fossa tumors so in this group of children what we first analyzed what they uh, authors here analyzed Uh, was the common mri signals characteristics in these uh, in these three tumors uh, so we found that uh, uh, medullo uh, in medulloblastoma none of the commonly used mri parameters like the t2 weighted signal uh, enhancement presence of cystic areas or presence of foraminal extension were very diagnostic uh, how in pilocytic astrocytoma we found that nearly almost all the pilocytic astrocytomas were had hyper intense uh, t2 uh, weighted signal changes uh, and they always had enhancement which means enhancement uh, many of us think is attributable to a malignant tumor so necessary does not need to be and it can be even seen in low grade tumors in children and cystic areas are also always uh, present in pilocytic uh, astrocytomas however what we found was there was medulloblastomas particularly had restricted diffusion in 95% of the um cases and in ependymomas there would be extension into the foramen of brushka or the foramen of medindi in almost 90% of the uh, patients now why is it important for us to have a preoperative idea of what the diagnosis is so firstly um, it will help us to counsel the uh, children's uh, uh, parents for example if you are suspecting a diagnosis of pilocytic astrocytoma you would counsel them accordingly with respect to the surgery the outcomes and all that because based on that they may take a decision uh, the secondly it also helps us like if you know a tumor is more or less like a pilocytic astrocytoma then we know that by logistic issue because several of us are having very long waiting list these patients can probably wait a little longer malignant tumor like a medulloblastoma or an ependymoma so these are examples from this uh, group as you can see this the first is a pilocytic astrocytoma which, which is brilliantly hyper intense here on t2 weighted uh, sequences um, with a solid uh, uh, component and a large uh, cystic component which all i had uh, um, attributed to in the previous uh, uh, slide 
the second is an ependymoma where you can see a large tumor filling the fourth ventricle and you can see that this is going out to the left foramen of uh, lushka so which is a common feature of the uh, of an ependymoma extension into the uh, foramen and uh, the third is a medulloblastoma which is predominantly hypointense and it has got variable patchy enhancement some medulloblastomas enhance very homogeneously and brilliantly some of them enhance uh, patchily in this fashion and there is a small en uh, enhancing area here so these are the common um, ways these tumors appear on the mri so if i had not written these uh, diagnoses here many of us would still be uh, not be able to diagnose them with uh, uh, certainty and hence it's important that we have more additional sequences of mri so in this study what uh, was reported was that medulloblastomas have got significant um, the low mean uh, adc compared to the uh, other uh, two pathologies pilocytic astrocytoma and ependymoma atrt also has a poor restriction but here the numbers are very small so i do not want to elaborate much on that and it's a very uncommon tumor so medulloblastoma definitely has got a restricted diffusion as is uh, shown here so these are examples of patients with a pilocytic astrocytoma where you see no restricted uh, diffusion in these images this is another child with a ependymoma and here again there is not much of restricted diffusion but in the medulloblastoma you can see marked restriction of diffusion as seen here black on the adc images they also found that higher grade tumors that is grade 2 or grade 3 grade 2 grade 3 or grade 4 tumors that the anaplastic group of ependymomas and medulloblastomas had a higher chance of having a restricted diffusion and uh, also significantly as i mentioned earlier low grade tumors seem to have, have intense contrast enhancement compared to the higher grade tumors such as medulloblastomas or ependymomas then in this study which has been again uh, uh, reported from the tata institute in uh, tmh mumbai uh, they did a artificial intelligence based uh, mri uh, prediction of molecular subgrouping in medulloblastomas so as we all know medulloblastomas have been subdivided into four subgroups this namely the bint subgroup the sonic hedgehog or sshh subgroup the group uh, the non bint and non sshh which have been further classified as group 3 and group 4 so in these slides we are seeing the survival curve of all these four subgroups where we know bint is thus bint subgroup does very well and the group 3 subgroup uh, group 3 subgroup does the worst so this was based on the molecular subgroup of these uh, you know, or based on histology they calculated the survival of these uh, patients and then this was based on the predicted subgroup on the mri and you can see that both these graphs are almost um, mimicking each other which means the mr characteristics of prediction of the sshh and the group 4 are done with very high accuracy but wnt and group 3 don't seem to have so much of uh, accuracy nevertheless uh, using artificial intelligence and radio genomics uh, we will we have moved forward in being able to predict the grade of uh, the medulloblastoma to a large extent on the preoperative image and this will again help us in prognosticating these uh, children's management prognosticating the children's uh, management with, and discussing their management with the uh, parents so to summarize uh, the use of radiology in posterior fusa uh, tumors uh, we would recommend that we do a t1 weighted fat suppressed uh, post gado brain uh, mri and also spine images whenever uh, diagnosis of medulloblastoma or ependymoma is um, suspected a t2 weighted drive or the uh, heavily weighted t2 weighted sequences or the cis sequences is useful because it helps you in deline delineating the um, tumor with respect to the fourth ventricular fourth ventricle and the brain stem the t2 weighted flare sequences are extremely useful in seeing whether there is edema in the brain stem and in the cerebellar peduncles in relation to the uh, tumor which will tell us that these tumors are likely to infiltrate brain stem or the um, cerebellar peduncles in the region and as i mentioned earlier diffusion weighted imaging does help in predicting uh, medulloblastoma and other higher grade uh, tumors so moving on from uh, uh, radiology uh, the next problem that we usually face in these uh, patients with posterior midline posterior fusa tumors is preoperative uh, hydrocephalus so there is an excellent uh, review in the Neuro neurology india supplement by dr muthu kumar on hydrocephalus associated with posterior fusa tumors and its uh, management and i would strongly recommend that all the juniors read this to have a complete understanding of this uh, topic but i have will briefly summarize a few uh, points so 70 to 90% of patients with midline posterior fusa tumors or post or um, 
children with midline posterior fossa tumors have preoperative hydrocephalus and almost 95% of them are symptomatic at presentation in some way or the other so they can be either man managed preoperatively with the uh, uh, steroid use which can help us in buying some time or uh, we could some of them may require a placement of an external ventricular drain followed by uh, tumor excision particularly if they are having severe bradycardia or come to us in altered sensorium or uh, in some instances where they may be able to wait for a few days we may attempt direct tumor excision with opening of the csf pathways or in a certain percentage of patients particularly in those whom we already know that there is leptomeningeal uh, metastasis or whom, whom we feel that the tumor may not be able to we may not be able to remove adequate tumor to open up the csf pathways we may want to uh, place a ventricular peritoneal shunt or an uh, uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy and in our uh, series of 200 consecutive patients about 21% of them needed a preoperative shunt placement so what are the advantages and possible disadvantages of uh, preoperative shunt placement so firstly uh, pre placement of a preoperative shunt um, is a life saving procedure secondly as reported from cmc velo for the first time in the world uh in back way back uh, in 1963 that's almost uh, 60 years ago that it was able to reduce the mortality of um, uh, in children with posterior fossa tumors from 40% to 8% just by placing a shunt because when they place a shunt what they observed was one the uh, symptom of raised icp was sort, uh, sorted out and also some people also observed that these children who have severe vomiting then could gain a little bit of nutrition by the uh, by the time they are ready for the definitive surgery and probably this also contributed to the reduction in the mortality then the brain is obviously lax at the time of surgery when the when the csf diversion procedure has been done and there are several times logistic issues as many of us face because we don't have operating time so we may have to buy some time we may perform a shunt or recently during the covid pandemic there was a situation when children came or they were covid positive or when the elective surgeries were cancelled we had to perform shunts in several of these Uh, patients uh, what are the possible disadvantages that have been reported in literature include upward or reverse herniation wherein the culmen of the cerebellum herniates upwards causing a compression of the midbrain the some people feel that they may uh, the shunts may shift the tumor towards the brain stem making surgery more difficult later on and shunt is always another disease sometimes and it's got its own inherent complications like that of uh, obstruction or infection and what we people observed is only about 40% of patients ultimately require a post operative shunt and hence if we are going to shunt all the patients we will be doing unnecessary shunts in nearly 60% of the patients so how do we plan surgery for these children in uh, posterior fossa tumor so as we discussed earlier when they are symptomatic for hydrocephalus either they will go for an external ventricular drain or a ventricular peritoneal shunt in our center we prefer to do a ventricular peritoneal shunt rather than an etv because in several of these patients the brain stem is pushed anteriorly and hence uh, and as an emergency procedure it may be easier to perform a uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt moreover when there is a malignant tumor like a medulloblastoma or an ependymoma which requires radiation later on the chance of an etv getting blocked is higher compared to that of a ventricular peritoneal shunt positioning these patients are usually performed in a prone position with a military tuck opening up the uh, space between the foramen magnum and the c1 uh, however we prefer to do a modified concord position in those patients who, where the tumor is extending into the tentorial incisura or in located in the superior uh, vermis as it helps us in i uh, getting control from the tentorium uh, much easier with a modified concord position a uh, craniectomy or craniotomy can be uh, done and uh, we routinely excise the c1 posterior arch in these patients because the tonsils are herniated and we would like to release csf from the upper dorsal cervical subarachnoid space below the level of the herniated tonsils uh, at the time of surgery in order to make the brain lax then uh, it is important that in these children we reduce the amount of blood loss that happens during surgery particularly in patients with medulloblastoma and ependymoma which can be quite vascular tumors so what uh, uh, we have to do is we have to try and go around the tumor as far as possible and then devascularize it from the adjacent uh, pile uh, bleeding then do a quick decompression and then try to remove the uh, tumor and once the initial decompression is done itself we have to try and identify the plane with the brain stem and have to make sure that we do not cross this plane and enter the fourth ventricular floor and in all 
uh, at all times of following the maximal safe resection, we have to try and ensure that the aqueduct is open and blood also does not go into the uh, aqueduct. The reason for that I will come to later on. And we use certain adjuncts to reduce uh, blood loss. So we did a short, uh, small retrospective uh, uh, study on the role of intraoperative uh, use of tranexamic acid in children with uh, midline uh, posterior for the tumors. Tranexamic acid is an anti-fibrinolytic uh, agent and helps, it prevents clot, uh, clots from getting dissolved and it promotes uh, coagulation. And it has been commonly used in patients with uh, hematological disorders. It has been used in orthopedic surgery and in craniosynostosis. Um, and there are a few reports of it being used in adult uh, patients with uh, brain tumors, but uh, hardly any reports from in patients with uh, posterior for the tumors. So we have been using uh, tranexamic acid routinely from almost 2014. So we did a retrospective analysis of our cases uh, to, from 2014 to 2017, about 36 patients, and compared them with historical controls who did not receive uh, tranexamic acid. So the numbers are small, but still it was an important study and it's been accepted now in the child's uh, nervous system. So inclusion criteria we used was midline posterior for a solid tumor. So these were the tumors we thought that will have much more uh, chance and underwent a gross total resection or a subtotal resection. So we excluded patients who underwent only a biopsy or a, a very limited uh, excision. So again, um, vascular, uh, they may not have a significant blood loss. So the protocol we followed is that tranexamic acid was administered with induction, usually about 20 to 30 minutes before the scalp incision. That's a bolus dose, so 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram over 20 minutes. And then uh, we, gave, uh, we gave boluses 3 to 5 milligram per kilogram of maintenance dose every three hours until the end of uh, surgery. So these are the results, 36 patients in the tranexamic acid group and uh, uh, 14 patients in the uh, control group, the historical uh, uh, controls. So you can see that most of the parameters are equal or similar in both the groups. So both the groups are comparable. They had similar uh, distribution of tumors. The tumor size was equal. Uh, the weight, age, and the BMI of these children were uh, similar. Preoperative hemoglobin was similar. And the gross uh, the extent of resection was also similar in both the uh, groups as, as, as the duration of um, surgery and their postoperative stay. So we found that uh, the group that received tranexamic acid had a significantly lower uh, blood loss, uh, which is calculated, uh, compared to the group historical controls, which did not receive uh, tranexamic acid. Uh, we also found that the use of crystalloids was uh, higher in the group that uh, did not receive uh, tranexamic acid as compared to that which received tranexamic uh, acid, indicating that they definitely there was a more volume of uh, volume loss in these patients, requiring necessitating more transmission of fluids. However, we did not find the, uh, um, the number of patients who are requiring FFP or PRC or other blood products being different between the uh, two groups statistically. Although in this control group, more uh, patients seem to have received uh, these uh, products compared to the tranexamic acid group. So we concluded that uh, tranexamic acid is definitely a useful adjunct in children with uh, midline posterior fossa tumors. And now we are planning a more uh, randomized um, study looking at different dosages and dosing patterns. Um, the other advantage of tranexamic acid, if we have a very vascular tumor and uh, it is difficult to attain hemostasis, we can continue this drug for one or two days postoperatively. And that, is all, that may also help in reducing the chance for postoperative bleed. Now we're coming on to uh, postoperative hydrocephalus, which is a problem with, in many of these uh, patients. And it's been reported in literature that almost 30% uh, of patients uh, post, post uh, resection will require uh, a shunt placement after a posterior post tumor excision. So in this retrospective analysis of 148 children with posterior post tumors without a preoperative shunt, uh, um, 141 of these 140 patients had preoperative hydrocephalus. Among them, a large majority, almost 90% of them had symptomatic hydrocephalus at presentation. And our strategy was to place an EVD if required, followed by an attempt at direct tumor excision in this cohort. Now, you must remember that in this cohort does not include patients who had undergone a post a preoperative um, shunt. So with this surgical strategy, we were able to achieve a gross total resection in 67% of our patients and a subtotal resection with opening of the aqueduct and another 27%. And 10 patients required perioperative EVD placement. 
and we analyze the risk factors for early post operative hydrocephalus within one month of tumor excision so why is it important to analyze the early post operative hydrocephalus because when you look at literature most people have combined uh, post operative hydrocephalus when they talk about post operative hydrocephalus they talk of, talk about both early post operative hydrocephalus as well as late post op hydrocephalus now early post op hydrocephalus may be because of cerebellar swelling because of uh, blood in the ventricles or subarachnoid uh, space or meningitis um, and so on uh, while the late post operative uh, hydrocephalus may can be because of other factors like the use of radiation therapy which can also cause scarring of the subarachnoid space and hence these two groups cannot be mixed so hence we look our definition of uh, hydrocephalus in this particular study was hydrocephalus occurring within one month of tumor excision so we did a univariate and the multivariate analysis of uh, patients who required a shunt which is uh, 14 of these 138 patients that is almost 9.4% which is far less than what is uh, reported in uh, uh, literature mm. and we found that uh, age less than 6 years extent of resection that is when gross total resection or subtotal resection was done opening up the csa pathways um, it was there was a less chance of uh, have, uh, requiring a, a shunt Uh, post-operative meningitis, either bacterial meningitis or aseptic meningitis, was a risk factor requiring a post-operative shunt, and presence of intraventricular uh, blood, which is uh, also was on the univariate analysis. However, on the multivariate analysis, we found that only age less than six years and the presence of intraventricular blood were significant predictors of post-operative uh, hydrocephalus or post-resection hydrocephalus in this group of uh, patients with posterior fossa tumors. So this is an example of a seven-year-old boy who underwent a fourth ventricular uh, medulloblastoma. He underwent post-subtotal excision. Uh, he underwent the subtotal excision of the tumor, and the tumor along the brainstem and the cerebellar peduncles was uh, left behind at surgery, as can be seen in this post-operative uh, CT scan. And uh, there is hydrocephalus. However, he was, uh, but no blood is seen in the you know, ventricles, and he remained asymptomatic for hydrocephalus. And hence, we uh, followed him up, did not shunt him, and this is a scan. Uh, a uh, couple of years later where it shows all the tumor after adjuvant therapy where the tumor is almost completely resolved and hydrocephalus also resolved so this is another 5 year old boy with a bermian medulloblastoma we whom we have done a radical excision and hardly any tumor was seen in the post operative uh, uh, ct and of note you can you can see however in the post operative ct scan we saw blood in the third ventricle and in the lateral ventricles so a few days after surgery he came back to us with a csf leak and was symptomatic for uh, hydrocephalus as seen in the scan because compared to this scan which is done around uh, fourth or fifth post operative day this is a scan done about uh, 12 days uh, after surgery and he is already starting to develop uh, hydrocephalus of note the pre operative scan in this patient does not show hydrocephalus so hence uh, he required uh, ventricular Uh, peritoneal shunt placement so definitely post operative um, intraventricular hemorrhage is uh, definitely a risk factor for development of post op hydrocephalus and it is modifiable because at surgery we can prevent the entry of blood through the aqueduct in the third or the lateral ventricles by protecting by putting patties or protecting this uh, pathway So these are other risk factors that have been reported in literature for post-op hydrocephalus. It's a uh, younger age, midline tumors, partial tumor excision, severe placement of uh, external ventricular drain, post-operative meningitis, and for late onset hydrocephalus, radiation therapy may also be a factor. So what are the adjuvant therapies we offer for patients with midline children with midline posterior fossa tumors? medulloblastomas we tend to give craniospinal irradiation with carboplatin based uh, uh, chemotherapy and the prognosis depends as we all know on the molecular subtype the bint having the bint or wingless type having more than 80% survival the group 3 patients have got less than 40% survival at 5 uh, uh, years and among the sonic hedgehog the subtype with the T- tp53 wild type does better than the type with the tp53 mutant among the ependymomas depending on the presence of uh, spinal seeding we give cranial spinal or cranial uh, irradiation with the posterior uh, class subclassified as the pfa the posterior fossa a type and the posterior fossa b type sub type the posterior fossa a type which is commoner among children and it's the anaplastic type have got a poorer survival compared to the posterior fossa b sub type 
and pilocytic astrocytomas usually totally excised do not require any adjuvant therapy however they require long term follow ups um, and rt can be given if uh, excision is partial so to summarize midline posterior fossa tumors are common yet uh, challenging tumors in children and with advances in radiological diagnosis we can better predict the histology of the tumor preoperatively and adequate surgical planning is required to achieve maximal safe resection the judicious use of adjuvant therapy post operatively as we observed use of tranexamic acid helps in reducing blood loss at the time of um, surgery and the prevention of intraventricular blood seepage could reduce uh, the incidence of early post operative hepatitis in children uh, thank you Murugan sir, unmute yourself. Sir, Murugan sir. Murugan okay, sir, unmute yourself. Okay, the glass is back. He will take over. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now we will have the second topic: basics of basilar aneurysm surgery by Professor Dr. Joseph Jasper. Naveen, uh, Professor Dr. Joe Jasper is um, really the MBBS from CMC Vellu, MCH from Government Stanley Medical College, and the current position is the HOD of um, uh, Gauri Brain and Spine Center, Trichy. Interested in vascular, endoscopic, and the skull-based work. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. for your talk uh, good evening friends uh, thank you for this opportunity i think uh, i'll start with my screen sharing navin kumar uh, can you stop your screen sharing yeah so first of all yeah thank you i'm really happy to be here my presentation will be maybe taking 20 minutes of your time and i am trying i'll try to see whether i'll be able to you know like my talk is position more for post graduates than for i think practicing people yeah so this is more about the basics only the very very first reported papers about uh, basilar artery surgery was way back in 1965 when uh, drake you know presented his experiences with 14 cases prior to this in 1961 the first four cases were presented mortality and morbidity in this era was very high with almost 80 to 90% of the patients losing their life so in that era itself they were doing cases with hypothermia and cardiopulmonary bypasses and but the results were very poor results started improving only by 1980 85 so when we talk of basilar aneurysm we are in theory talking of either a basilar bifurcation which is actually a quad quadfurcation or a basilar trunk aneurysm now i'll first jump into basilar trunk and when we say basilar trunk uh, we actually divide it into upper and lower uh, depending on the position of the aneurysm in relationship to the ica so upper would be between ica and the superior cerebellar artery while lower is between the vertebro basilar junction and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery so uh, what we have to remember is the basilar trunk has lots of pontine uh, perforators and approaches will depend on where is the aneurysm if it is in the upper uh, basilar trunk then usually we combine it either with the uh, arterial with oz craniotomy with acp and pcp drilling but the mid level needs a transpetrosal approach while lower will need a more lateral suboccipital approach 
and we are not going to really talk about this here. The first question is, is a basilar aneurysm clippable? So this is just a nice picture to show you that when the keratid is retracted, along with the optic asthma, you can see that the basilar artery is lying just posterior to the keratid. And if we can see it, we can clip it, provided we have the right set of instruments, the right set of microscope, and obviously the right skill set and assistance to really do this surgery. So now, answer, yeah. a basic anatomy. This is a very nice picture. Obviously, I got it from Roton. The basilar artery at the bifurcation is usually around 2.7 to 4.3 millimeters. And it lies almost 15 to 17 millimeters posterior to the internal keratin artery, which is why still tyrionyl plays a very big role in clipping this aneurysm. Now, when you look at the superior cerebellar vessel and the posterior cerebral vessel, the superior cerebellar artery always appears very pink and it appears very red and healthy. When we compare it to the posterior cerebral artery, which can appear a very bit, you know, atheromatous. <laughs> now, the superior cerebellar artery is around one millimeter size in diameter and blood flow is almost 50 ml per minute. But the posterior cerebral artery always rises just, uh, you know, within two to three millimeters of the superior cerebellar artery. It's two to three millimeters in diameter. Blood flow is almost 100 ml per minute. Now, very important thing is here, if you look very carefully, you can see the presence of the third nerve between the posterior cerebral and the superior cerebellar. And they give rise to lots of thalamoperforators, which play a very important role in the vascular supply of the brain. <clears throat> now, this is a lateral view showing you that the green arrow, the green arrow actually is the distance between the internal carotid artery and the basal artery. It is only around 1.5 centimeters. And as you look along that pathway, you would see two important landmarks. One of that is the third nerve. And the second is the posterior cerebral artery, which lies always above the third nerve. The superior cerebellar actually lies below the third nerve. And the link between the internal carotid artery and the basilar artery is a PCOM artery, which is also visible here. So this is a very nice picture just to show you the basic anatomy of the basilar artery in relationship to the internal carotid artery and the third nerve and the posterior cerebral artery. This is another picture showing a bird's eye view. Now, when you look at this picture, I think it becomes more easy to understand that the PCOM links the anterior and the posterior circulation, and the PCOM's relationship to the oculomotor nerve is also seen. So when we do a transylvian or a lateral, you know, subtemporal approach, when you run into the third nerve, you know where the PCOM is going to be. You know where the posterior cerebral artery is going to be. <clears throat> so what are the factors that affect the treatment? The most important would be, obviously, patient's age and general medical condition presenting symptoms. Apart from that, aneurysm size, small versus large versus giant, location, projection, is it anterior or posterior projecting, ruptured or unruptured, multiplicity, and the intraluminal thrombus formation, calcification, etc. These are the main things that decide whether the patient actually needs endovascular or surgical approach to the tumor, to the aneurysm. The patient's wishes, obviously the experience of the practitioner, now with uh, neurosurgeons who are trained both in uh, coiling versus clipping, obviously it's a huge advantage. And calcified and posterior projecting aneurysms are usually chosen for endovascular therapy. I'm not really going to talk about endovascular therapy a lot, because it's a huge topic by itself. And there are better people, people who are more trained than I am to talk about that. Now, this is a very small chart just to show you. To clip or not to clip. There was a paper by Dr. Kato et al. in 2019 in interdisciplinary neurosurgery. Uh, we actually, we do not really go only based on this because here, posterior circulation aneurysms, most of them are taken up for Coiling. But here in India, we are still doing clipping in quite a few centers. 
But in general, a wide neck, which is not friendly to the endovascular surgeon, inadequate endovascular access, which means the you can have lots of tortuosity, or you might have only one important vessel there, and your, your chances of thrombosing it is high. Presence of intraluminar thrombus, arterial blanch occlusion, all this, or if you think you will not be able to occlude the uh, aneurysm, all those you will actually push the patient towards clipping. So once you have decided to clip, how do you decide on the approach? Approach will depend on the bifurcation. This is the first point to remember. If it is high, if it is anterior to the mesencephalon, normal would be roughly at the junction of the pontomesencephalic area, while low-lying basilar bifurcation is in the level of the pons. So you have to see where is the bifurcation. Is it high, is it normal, or is it low? And depending on that, the approaches will be decided. The most commonly used approaches are the terional, the subtemporal, subtemporal with cutting of the tentorium and the half and the half of the hybrid approach, which has lots of other names too. So how do you decide? Look, I'm going to do a terional. So terion or not. Useful for lesions or where the neck of the aneurysm is present from the mid-level of the dorsum to around one centimeter above the posterior clinal process. If your aneurysm goes higher, then obviously you'll need more temporal retraction and you end up doing a OC craniotomy, a zygoma excision, or a zygoma. And if your aneurysm is going to be lower, you need posterior clinal process drilling. And very rarely, a non-eloquent PCOM or a non-dominant even can be sacrificed if you think by sacrificing it, your axis really improves. So this is a rough picture. How high is high enough? So the midcellar line is drawn, and if the neck is within one centimeter of that, in fact, few people say if it is one centimeter from the PCP also, you can still go for uh, uh, clipping using the uh, terional transylvian approach. Now, normally we prefer right, obviously, because as surgeons, we are familiar with the right side, we are comfortable, and it's a non-dominant side, but left will depend on the shape of the aneurysm, the direction. For example, if the aneurysm itself is lying on a P1, then you might need more dissection to separate the P1 from the aneurysmal neck and the dome. So you will go on the side where it is lying on top of the P1. Or if you already have oculomotor palsy or hemiplegia, et cetera, then obviously you'll go on the left side. Now, why do we surgeons prefer terionalis? Because one, it is very familiar. In fact, uh, even a uh, person, a simple, you know, a postgraduate student doing a neurotrauma flap or a trauma surgery can combine a trauma surgery with terional to get a hang of the procedure. So it's a very familiar approach. And you can clip a anterior circulation aneurysm also on the way to your basilar aneurysm. Temporal lobe retraction is very minimal. Chance of oculomotor nerve injury is very minimal. Proximal control is easily available in a terional approach. And another huge advantage is, if you want to put a temporary clip to trap the aneurysm, you already have proximal control, you want both the P1s, then both the P1s is usually visible in a terional approach when compared to the subtemporal approach. So why not terional? If we all know it is a very deep and narrow approach, usually you traverse almost through eight to nine centimeters of subarachnoid space, which means your instruments have to be good, your microscope has to be good, and you need longer instruments. And as you go in, you're losing the leaves, you know, for the forest or the forest for the leaves. So it's become difficult to see. Posterior perforators are not very easily visible. And if you clip the aneurysm, you are not able to see the distal part of the clip. Your visualization is going to be poor. Very difficult is if your aneurysm is pointing posteriorly, because then, you're going to run into all your thalamoperforator, uh, perforators also, and very high reigning aneurysm, very difficult, because then either you'll have to do lots of temporal lobe retraction, or you might have to go through the supra carotid route, the, beyond the bifurcation of the carotid, where you have lots of perforators again. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk of the position, because in general position is given in all the textbook, but what we need to remember is, don't turn the head too much. 
usually we say turn it only 20 to 30 degrees contralateral because more than that what happens is your temporal lobe will fall keep on falling into the field and at 20 to 30 degrees your medial temporal your uh, medial to carotid approach is also very easy another thing is you have to obviously flex the chin towards the contralateral shoulder that way you basically bring the anterior cranial fossa floor perpendicular to the body to use so i think these are the two important things to remember there <clears throat> Now, okay, we have done a craniotomy, open the dura. What do we do? Obviously, you open the sylvian fissure. You've gone down to the keratids. You've seen the internal keratid artery. Now, you have to open up all the cisterns that are there. So, follow up the anterior choroidal artery, open up the choroidal cistern. Follow the posterior communicating artery, open up all the cisterns that are present there. Basically, you're opening up the liliquous membrane at each and every level. And... Once you catch the PCOM, you follow the PCOM inferiorly to the P1 and the PCOM junction. So we all know the posterior communicating artery meets the posterior cerebral artery. So we use the posterior communicating artery to catch the posterior cerebral artery. Only thing because there are lots of perforators, you must actually follow the inferior surface. Sometimes when you go, you might end up needing lots of contraction, which means maybe you need to let out more CSF. Now, when you follow that, you reach the basilar artery. So once you reach the basilar artery, you see the superior cerebellar artery there, and that must also be followed with the uh, basilar artery. Now, once you see the posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar artery, you actually create space for your first temporary clip. That is very important. You need space. So just below the posterior cerebral artery, you usually have two to three millimeters of space where you can put in your first clip. And if that is not enough, you might, if that space is not enough, you might have to go still lower, in which case you catch the superior cerebellar, go below that for your clip. And then follow the contralateral P1. Here you have to be very careful because you have to remember the thalamoperforators, obviously. And sometimes the aneurysm itself can be stuck to the clivus or it can be angled into the brain cell. So your uh, handling of the neck or the dome of the aneurysm has to be very careful. Another advantage of going inferiorly along the posterior community, communicating and the posterior cerebral is you have less chance of running into the aneurysm itself first if you go along the inferior surface of the P1. So confirm P1, like I already told you, P1 is always <clears throat> larger, thick-walled, more atherosclerotic. It looks dirty white, and it is always superior to third now. Superior cerebellar artery is always redder and thin-walled. It looks very thin-walled, actually, when you start routinely doing that area. <clears throat> so when you are approaching the basilar or the interpeduncular system, the carotid is always in your way. So we keep on changing our axis. Either you go between the optic and the carotid, that is medial to the uh, internal carotid artery, or you can go behind the retrocarotid along the PCOM, or rarely you can go superior to the carotid bifurcation also. But this is more useful if your internal carotid artery itself is very short, so you have lots of space above, or your basilar bifurcation is very high. So you need that leverage, that extensive leverage to reach the aneurysm. So most of the time, you're using only the two passages, both medial and lateral to the internal carotid. Rarely you go above the carotid also. <clears throat> so this is, again, a very nice picture just to show you the approaches. The yellow picture is lateral. The green arrow is medial to the carotid, while the red arrow actually goes above the bifurcation of the uh, carotid artery. This is another picture just to show you. When you look at this picture, it's again a very nice picture. The red arrow is a dangerous area. Very rarely, when we have no choice, we go supracarotid. But you can look at the leash of vessels that are present there. So if you're careless, you're going to cause lots of damages to the perforators. The easier thing is going medial and lateral to the carotid. And what we say is you have to use these two axes or approaches very judiciously. You can focus your microscope through one axis and you can bring in your clip applicator through the other so that your clip applicator is not 
hiding the aneurysm. So that is the main advantage of working along two axes of the keratins. This is just another picture to show you. Again, this is the A1-M1 bifurcation. You can see the amount of perforators that are present there. So it's actually a minefield. When, if, and when you dissect there, you have to use extremely high magnification, very sharp dissection. Your instruments have to be very good and do it only if it is absolutely indicated for high rising basilar apex. Now, this is what we have already said. Once you follow the PCOM to the P1, once you have seen both the PCAs, both the P1, P1, and you've seen both the superior cerebellar, then you can trap the aneurysm if you think you need trapping. The problem with trapping the aneurysm initially is sometimes there is very little space and you might not have enough space to bring in your actual permanent clip. So that is a call that has to be taken by the operating surgeon. <clears throat> So what are the problems with this Transylvian approach? Very narrow confined, very difficult to place a temporary clip, and it is obviously going to be difficult to clip either a very high low or a low lying basilar bifurcation. And we cannot see behind the basilar artery or the aneurysm, which means the perforators there might actually, we might end up losing them. This is to show you another view of the basilar artery. You can see the perforators, the thalamo perforator vessels that rise from the basilar bifurcation itself and from P1. Rarely, your aneurysmal dome can also have a thalamo perforators in it, which is why sometimes you might actually go from the lateral approach or the temporal approach. So when do we select the subtemporal approach? When and why? Always remember, when you're doing the subtemporal approach, you need lots of CSFT compression. So that might mean Adequate opening of the CSF pathways in the transylvian pathways, maybe a ventra intraventricular, uh, you know, e To a only any subtemporal approach, remember the vein of labe, and always remember chance of third nerve injury, third nerve injury is very high. So this is the lateral position usually suggested, pure lateral. <clears throat> if the temporal lobe is still very after adequate CSF relaxation, you might have to do a temporal lobectomy, either inferior temporal through the inferior but again, always pia on the other side, the arachnoid on the other side, because that arachnoid will prevent this brain from unating inside. And as you lift up the uncus, the third nerve is usually stuck on it. It will need some fine dissection, and you can always either split the tentorium or stitch the tentorium if you want to retract. Remember the fourth. And here, this is normally that you see the two things you see. One would be the third nerve and the next would be the superior cerebellar artery. So here what you do is you follow the superior cerebellar artery to the basilar. From there, go up, see the P1, then go to the contralateral P1 and contralateral superior cerebellar artery. So this is the subtemporal approach, just to show you a picture. Here you can see that although we can see the basilar artery and the post the basilar artery, you're not able to see the contralateral P1. So it cannot be seen. And if your aneurysm is pointing posteriorly, you'll still have space to put in a clip there. This is Drake's half and half approach, otherwise known as Sanos temporopolar or pretemporal. This is a combination of terional and anterior subtemporal. Advantage is less temporal injury, perforators can be seen better, and the contralateral P1 also, working space is high. But again, here, Disadvantages because what you have to do open the sylvian much more than you would normally open. And sometimes to open the sylvian a lot, you might have to sacrifice temporal veins because you're opening the frontal and the temporal real hugely. You can end up with ICA traction. 
and smaller vessels can get avulsed. Now, a variation of this was by, again, you know, used by Sir Pavel's approach, perional approach through extended lateral corridor. Again, here, literally the principles are the same. Very wide sylvian dissection and the medial temporal and the third nerve are seen. They say, make sure your focus is always on the third nerve because that gives you the orientation. And then from there, you can go follow the superior cerebellar artery, put a clip on the temporary, uh, temporary clip on the basal artery, be able to dissect perforators before you actually put in your main clips. So that is a badges Pavel's approach. In fact, what we have seen is, in our experience, better to go in uh, keeping a hybrid approach in mind. So it is always a combination of terional with subtemporal, where the advantages of one will outweigh the disadvantages of the other. Now, whatever the approach, you have reached the neck. Once you reach the neck, basically start, slowly start dissecting the aneurysm, free the perforators, and you can use your suction to slightly pull the uh, basilar artery so that you can see what is behind, what is on both the sides. And you can have perforators near P1. So again, you have to remember that P1 and third nerve have to be preserved when you. So what are the technical errors? Thalamo damage will cause diencephalon damage, permanent uh, or death. And you can have a leftover dog here. You can have intraop rupture. You can have temporal lobe and vein of lab injury. So that is what. So when we think of clipping, we normally take patients with who have difficult endovascular access, either due to bilateral vertebral artery stenosis, tortuous vascular anatomy, large neck when compared to the dome, non-fetal P1, if there is the large bleed which is causing compression, or with the aneurysm is within uh, one centimeter plus or minus one centimeter. Our experiences, we have done almost 15 cases, two were coiled, 13 were operated, two died, three had poor grade, good grade recovery was possible in almost eight patients. This is just a small example here. You can see this is a patient with a basilar rupture, basilar artery aneurysm. And the posterior cerebral artery also has a small blep there. In fact, that was a that had ruptured. So I'll just play the video. So first, obviously, we are going, you know, cross the sylvian, splitting the liliquist, etc. I'll take maybe just another one minute more. <clears throat> so this is the basilar. You can see the basilar bifurcation there. This is very high magnification. I did to first clip the left PCA aneurysm because that bleb was looking very, very dangerous. You can see it is looking very red, very thin walled. I was very worried that bleb will rupture actually. And you can see the clip here under my suction. I've turned my microscope field so that I can see the basilar neck before I, the dome neck, before I put in my clip. And edited the video, we had made sure there were no perforators where we are putting the clip. So, just to summarize, the main nuances is perional transylvian, go very low, go as low as possible, remove as much bone as possible, always plan for anterior clinoidal processes, uh, drilling before itself, be very patient, let CSF drain, lumbar drain if necessary, open lamina terminalis, cystinostomy helps. I feel all postgraduates when they do their, they do cystinostomies, this actually becomes very easy. <clears throat> ACP drilling, if necessary, then follow the posterior communicating artery to the posterior cerebral basilar, or you can hold on to the third nerve, follow the third nerve posteromedially because you know 
You're going to find both the PCA above and the superior cerebellar artery below. Use the space between P1 and superior cerebellar artery for temporary clipping. If you think the neck is very low lying, if you think you are not able to get your clip applicator inside, drill the PCP. Use high magnification. Very often we see that when we use the routine normal magnification, it is not enough. Use very high magnification. That is something we have to tell ourselves very frequently. Soften the aneurysm, either temporary clips, lower BP, and you can use adenosine. Then you clip, check perforators on the neck to put saline wash and come out. In conclusion, in India, clipping has a cost advantage. It is still relevant. It's very challenging. The surgeries are always very challenging, heart stopping, but the results can be very rewarding. And clipping and coiling will always exist. Uh, they complement each other. And in India, depending on the facilities, skill set available, patient condition, cost, etc., we will have to decide between surgery and uh, coiling. Now, in closing, I'd like to thank my teachers, Dr. Dvanganathan Jodi, who pioneered, gave me interest in neurosurgery, and Dr. Thirumaran, who actually gave me lots of interest in doing vascular surgery. <laughs> On behalf of Kaveri, thank you, dear friends, for your patient listening. Thank you so much, sir. We will have the questions at the end of uh, all the four talks. And uh, again, I request all of you to please enter in the chat box your name, your email ID, your uh, Tamil Nadu Medical Council registration number, or any other registration number of the state and your WhatsApp number, so that you, we will be able to get the credit hours. And uh, now we will have, before the next talk, we will have the first uh, question uh, from uh, the, the Professor Dr. Ranjit Sir's topic. You, you can answer in the chat box itself. The question number one, among the following subgroups of medulloblastoma, which has the best survival? One, A, B, C, D. The first responder will be getting the prize, and we will be announcing at the end of all the talks. Okay, now we will go to the third lecture by Professor Dr. A.S. Ramesh. The topic is Surgical Management of Craniovertebral Junction Instability. A small introduction about Professor Ramesh, sir. Professor Ramesh is MCH from 2009 in Madras Medical College, Chennai, consultant in government of Pondicherry, <coughs> and assistant professor in the neurosurgery department in since 2011, and assistant professor in neurosurgery department in Dipner 2013. Currently working as the head of the neurosurgery department at Jitmer, running adult and pediatric spine special training, expert member of the standard treatment for flow for neurosurgery organized by the Department of Health Services and ICMR, has given many articles in reported journals. I welcome you, sir, for the lecture. Thank you, sir. I thank the organizer for giving this opportunity. Um, I'll share my slides. So, am I audible? Yes, sir.
coming to the surgical management of cranial vertebral tension instability, I just try to touch the basics of uh, surgical management, especially for the postgraduate students. Atlot axial joint and occipital outline joint. Atlot axial joint is the most mobile, and the occipital outline joint is the most stable joint in the body. Both mobility and stability are the hallmarks of CV junction. Occipital outline instability is an extremely rare condition. Basically, the CVG instability means atlanto axial instability. Stabilization refers to atlanto. So, how will you diagnose atlanto axial instability? On the basis of abnormal ab atlanto dental interval on dynamic images. On a flexed hip position, if the atlanto dental interval is more than 3 mm in adults and more than 5 mm in children below 5 years, are the indicators of Atlanta axial instability. Neural compression by odontoid process is also an indication for ST instability. In mobile Atlanta axial instability, the Atlanta dental interval reduces to normal on extension of neck. In a fixed or partially mobile or partially fixed Atlanta axial not, does not reduce or reduce incompletely. How do they present? Most of the patients, patients are asymptomatic, but they present with spectrum of clinical signs and symptoms like neck pain, restricted neck movements, pyramidal signs and myelopathy, low ear cranial palsies, respiratory failure, vertebral artery dissection, quadriplegia, sometimes death. Atlanta axial instability is seldom discovered incidentally during radiological evaluation. Clinicians must obtain a complete history to get adequate management. The history of past, present or previous trauma is very important, especially in children. How will you investigate a patient with Atlanta axial instability? Dynamic lateral X-rays, cranial vertebral junction, neutral flexion extension views, spiral CT with sagittal and coronal decades images, MRI cranial vertebral junction with spine and brain screening. CT vertebral angiography will help you in the pre uh, to assess the vertebral anomalies, artery anomalies. Intraoperatively, use of Doppler as well as neurophysiological monitoring will help you to identify the complications. Classification of Atlant axial dislocation. So there are so many classifications. It can be classified according to the cause or direction of dislocation, time since dislocation happened or reducibility. Some of the name classifications are Greenberg, Fielding, Wang classification, Goyal classification, TOI classification. Coming to the cause, it can be due to traumatic, congenital or pathological causes like tuberculosis, infection and inflammation like metal arthritis and tumor. According to the direction of dislocation, it can be anterior, posterior, and rotational. According to the time, since dislocation, it can be classified as fresh or old types. And according to the reducibility of dislocation, it will be classified as reducible, irreducible, or non-reducible types. Coming to the Greenberg classification, it is, reduced, it is classified as reducible and irreducible. Fielding classification, Classifies as type 1, 2, 3, and 4 based on the rotation of C1. Wang's classification classifies as instability, reducible dislocation, irreducible, and bony dislocations. Goyal classifies the Atlanta instability depending upon the alignment of facets on lateral imaging. TOA classification it classifies the AAS, fraction reduction type, operation reduction type, and irreducible type. Coming into the details of Wang's classification, Depending on the, the reducibility on dynamic X-rays, it is classified as in a type 1 as instable uh, AI. Type 2, based on the reducibility with skeletal traction under general anesthesia, is uh, classified as reducible. If it is redu irreducible with skeletal traction under general anesthesia, it's classified as irreducible. Dislocation with bony abnormalities that are visualized by reconstructive CT as classified as bony dislocations. Coming to the field classification, based on the rotational dislocation, classified as type 1, 2, 3, and 4. In type 1, there will be a unilateral subluxation with intact transfers ligament. This is the most common type. Type 2, it's also unilateral facet subluxation, but with 3 to 5 millimeter anterior displacement. We can see an injured transverse ligament. Type 3, 
is a bilateral anterior facet displacement more than 5 mm it's a high risk injury and type 4 also high risk injury it present with posterior displacement of atlas coming to the goyes classification based on the alignment of facets on lateral imaging he classifies as type 1 2 and 3 in type 1 facets of atlas are dislocated anterior to the in type 2 facet of atlas is dislocated posterior to the tough axis in type 3 the facets are aligned instability is confirmed by clinical and specific radiological cues coming to the toi classification it's based on etiology course of the disease flexion extension equiris three times lens ct reconstruction and the effect of skull traction it classified as traction reduction type t type operation reduction type o type irreducible type i type coming to the traction reduction type following successful reduction of dislocated atlantic axial joints and uh, we will see the the reduction in ct images it's further classified into type t1 and t2 based on the duration of injury coming to the operation reduction type o type this type is unsatisfactory shows unsatisfactory reduction after 1 to 2 weeks of cervical traction the last type is irreducible type it will not show a reduction in the x ray or ct images even after surgical release coming to the treatment strategies possible one so he advised to go for posterior fusion procedure if it is irreducible but become traction after general anesthesia the approach is from posterior if it is irreducible even with skeletal traction under general anesthesia then so procedure is go you have to go for transoral release anteriorly and then go for posterior fusion if it is a type 4 or bony dislocation what and tidectomy as well as fusion treatment strategies according to toi classification the types are type t 1 and 2 type 4 and type 5 basically type t is it's a reducible one o is satisfactorily reduced and i is irreducible one for reducible ones advise to go for posterior approach for radial irreducible one you have to go for anterior release followed by posterior approach non operative management cervical traction with active range of motion motion exercises followed by ambulatory immobilization with active range of motion exercises surgical approach is broadly classified into posterior approach and anterior approach among the posterior approach we have posterior wire fixation techniques like galley fusion brick fusion lamina clamp fixation techniques posterior transarticular screw fixation posterior pedicle its lateral mass screw rod fixation technique that goyle harms technique and occipital cervical fusion technique so for a posterior fixation technique this is the uh, position that, uh, which patient is fixed action on line with intraoperative physical neurophysiological monitoring coming to the galleys and brooks fusion it is used for patient with intact posterior structures and without odontoid fractures it's easy to perform but care must be taken to prevent spinal cord injury during insertion of wire there is little difference between the two techniques galleys and brooks in galleys technique the wire passes only through the posterior arch of atlas after which an appropriately shaped bone graft is implanted between c1 posterior arch and c2 spinous process in brooks technique the wire passes through the both c1 and c2 posterior arch graft is placed in between c1 c2 posterior arches and wire is attached to the posterior bony structures the wire has insufficient anti rotation strength so a rigid cervical brace is recommended post operatively until bony fusion is confirmed by radiography coming to the lamina clamp technique is safer than the wire technique and easy to perform but however like wires it also has insufficient anti rotation strength coming to the posterior transarticular fixation that's magnet's method combined with posterior wire fixation in magnet screws screws must be inserted after the reduction of atlantic axial dislocation screws are inserted along the guide wire 
in the sagittal direction entering c2 close to the lower edge of caudal process of c2 with its c3 joint the screw passes through the lateral mass with the superior articular surface of axis of atlas and points to towards the anterior tubercle of atlas under fluoroscopic guidance to augment the anti rotation strength of tungsten mangel screw technique is combined with posterior wire fixation techniques conditions that preclude transarticular screw replacement are pathology and c1 lateral masses such as comminuted fractures or tumors destroying the c1 lateral masses anomalous course of vertebral artery and ct injury like artery coming to the posterior pedicle lateral mass screw fixation that's uh, goyer harms technique the key anatomic landmark for accurate placement of c1 lateral mass screw is the c1 c2 joint in harms method c2 dorsal root ganglion is retracted inferiorly but in goyer's method c2 ganglion is sacrificed in the entry point for atlas screw is in the posterior rim of lateral mass under the posterior arch of c1 the screw will be directed 10 to 20 degree medially and capillary direction into the c2 lat c1 lateral mass aiming at the anterior tubercle of and of c1 under fluoroscopic guidance taking into account individual anatomic variations entry point for c2 pedicle screw is located at the superior and medial quadrants of the lateral sur mass surface the direction of c2 pedicle screw was approximately 20 to 30 degree medial and capillary with 3.5 to 4 mm in diameter and uh, around 20 to 32 mm in length which is guided by the superior and medial surface of c2 isthmus taking into individual anatomical variations c2 lamina represent a viable fixation point for c1 c2 and cranial cervical arthrodesis in children goyle's technique the screws are connected to a plate in harms technique the rod is preferred both techniques are called goyle harms technique when you compare that uh, magler's technique and uh, goyle's harm technique the improvement in numeric uh, rating scale for pain assessment or disability index there is no difference or also in frankel's grade also and in proper screw position and fusion rate also there is no difference coming to the total bleeding amount is lesser with the uh, screw rod construct compared to transarticular screws operation time and extra exposure time were shorter in screw rod constructs compared to transarticular screws both transarticular screws and uh, screw rod constructs are safe and effective for c1 c2 fixation but technical demanding and extra exposure might be expected better in screw rod construct group than transarticular group occipital cervical fusion it's an indicator for occipital cervical instability and uh, associated with concomitant bizarre imagination and osseous anomaly of c1 and failed previous atlanta axial fusions this construct restrict the head movements long term complications associated with occipital cervical fusion are graft subsidence instability of subaxial spine coming to the anterior approaches transoral approach transoral release decompression transoral anti reduction and fixation with plates and retrofusion approach coming to the transoral technique the mouth is held open with the retractor and the longitudinal incision has to be made along the midline of pharyngeal wall and at the full elimination anterior structures of the atlas and axis will be exposed soft scarring will be removed with an electric knife and the bony edges will be removed high speed power drill when performing transoral release all soft tissue scarring between anterior arch of atlas and dense must be thoroughly eradicated to allow the opening of lateral cusset joints for fixation the plate is butterfly shape after transoral release upper beam of the plate is initially fixed to the atlas masses with the two screws next an instant screw is inserted onto the axis vertebra along the plate slide groove so the groove can slide freely up and down the groove the upper and lower hooks of the reduction clamp then is connected to the upper beam plate's upper beam and instant screw after which the perpendicular force is applied by the clamp to pull the atlas cranially and the horizontal force is applied to push the atlas posteriorly 
to achieve full reduction. Coming to the anterior retropharyngeal approach, the C1 entry after uh, the skin is made one inch below the mandible, and uh, after opening the layers, digastric tendon and hypoglossal nerves are identified. They are retracted after uh, reaching the prevertebral space and exposing the um, uh, this one, longest quality muscle and dissected. After identifying the C1 and C2, the C2 entry point has to be made five millimeter above the midpoint of the C1 C2 joint with a three millimeter drill directed 20 degree upwards and outwards for a depth of 15 to 20 millimeter, four millimeter titanium screw with a length of 18 to 20 millimeter passed through a titanium plate of 3.5 millimeter. C2 body entry point has to be made just above the C2-3 disc space and drill bit is directed 20 degree medially for an 18 to 20 millimeter depth. Again, the four millimeter cartilage screw will be placed to secure the plate. Before fixing the lower screw, the head will be extended, a rotation is corrected, and positioned to reduce the axial dislocation, which is confirmed by intraoperative CM imaging. The procedure will be repeated on the opposite side. For cage application and fixation, the exposure is the same, but it will be added with cage distraction as well as the uh, fixation. So through anterior retrofarial approach. degree downward tilt. It could be seen and felt through traverse C2 giant space, bone graft, and passing through the lateral mass of the C1. A 3.5 millimeter titanium cortical screw of 20 to 22 millimeter has to be passed through, secure the C1, C2 lateral masses. Repeated on the opposite side. From a, from a, from a right side approach, it is always easier to pass the half screw, hence it will be performed first. Ypsilateral screws require a retraction of the soft tissue of the pharynx, which can be added to technical difficulty. Intraoperative complications include spinal cord injury, vertebratory injury. Spinal cord injury can happen during positioning of the, positioning of the patient or due to operative manipulations. Intraoperative use of neurophysiology monitoring can, will be helpful to identify the spinal cord injury. Vertebratory injury can happen while exposing the uh, Surgical, during surgical exposure or while inserting the screws. In the presence of high riding vertebral artery, placement of pedicle screws is significantly safer than placement of transarticular screws. Preoperative CT and use of intraoperative Doppler will be helpful to locate the anomalous vertebral artery. To conclude, atlantoaxial dislocation surgery is a high risk procedure because of its close proximity to the important neurovascular structures. Short-term complications include wound infection, loosening of fixation, and re-dislocation. Long-term complications include instrumentation failure, non-union of bone graft, and re-dislocation. Individualized procedures are necessary to minimize the risk as much as possible to be performed by only where this specific indications and should be done by skilled and experienced surgeons. Take all effective measures to prevent this complication and to achieve good results. So these are our work. Um, between 2010 and 15, we operated 46 cases. Out of uh, 25 patients had complete radiological and clinical records. So we had taken three parameters like neuric grade, atlanto dental interval, and effective current diameter at the C1 level. We try to correlate among the duration of symptom, neuric grade, and changes in effective current diameter and atlanto dental interval. There was no significant neurological improvement in the immediate post-operative period. Statistically, significant improvement was observed in effective canal diameter and atlanto dental interval. There was no significant correlation among the duration of symptoms, uric grade, and changes in effective canal diameter and atlanto dental interval. So we concluded that effective canal diameter and atlanto dental interval may serve as useful parameters to assess the neurological improvement 
in the early postoperative period in patients with atlanta acid dislocations. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, Dr. Professor Ramesh, sir. <clears throat> now we will have the uh, second question. Who and when originally described the temporopolar approach as described by Sano in 1980, the modified terional anterior temporal approach as described by Sandin in 1990? Okay, now we will have the last speaker, Professor Dr. C. Ramasamy, the management challenges in common neurological illness, chronic subdural hematoma. Professor Dr. C. Ramasamy. <clears throat> Just a minute, sir. He has done an MBBS from Tanjur Medical College, an MS from Tanjur Medical College, and M MCH from uh, Min Chen Madras Institute of Neurology, Chennai, and um, assistant professor in Neurosurgery Department, TMCH 2007 to 2019, Tanjur, and uh, associate professor. Neurosurgery, KAPV Medical College, MGM Government Hospital, Trichy, from 2011 to 2012, and Associate Professor Tanjavur Medical College from 2012 to 2019. Professor KAPV Medical College, MGM Government Hospital, Trichy. He was the organizing chairman for the Tans Conference Tanjur in June 2020, uh, in April and May 2022. Uh, now I welcome my doctor, Professor Dr. C. Ramasamy, sir to give his lecture. So Ramsam sir, you can start to share your screen sir.
Thank you very much, sir. Hello, audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajit Bhav, sir. Once again, I, uh, good evening to all. First of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rajesh Babu, sir. So my topic is a very, very common neurosurgical illness, chronic cerebral hematoma. See, most of the chronic cerebral hematoma is one of the common neurosurgical illness come across by the neurosurgeons. It's a pleasure to operate and also the, it will be favorable and it, uh, for the patient as well as for the doctor also. <clears throat> Sometimes, in most of the occasions, the patient will come, will operate, everything will become smooth without any unhelpful things. <coughs> we are also happy, patient also happy. But sometimes, we are in trouble. I had a very, very unpleasant ex experience with the chronic cerebral hematoma. That's why I want to share this. And I had a patient of 65-year-old female presented with... Uh, you, you put the uh, slideshow, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Slideshow, you put it, sir. Slide show. Slide show and then you move on to the next slide. Okay, sir. No, it is not come. Slide show. Slide show. Sir, now I will see, sir. Hello. Screen is seen, sir, but uh, you have to put the uh, slideshow. Slide, slide show. Sir, are you able to see? Hello? Mm, able to see, but the slideshow is not. So you go to the next slide then. It's all right. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I... I am presenting a case of front cerebral hematoma operated by... Sir, go to the next slide. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, as an examination, patient was in drowsy state or also... Sir, next slide. Next slide, you have to go. Yes, now? No, no, you have to... Uh, I think you have to stop sharing the screen and again you have to... Sharing. Yeah, stuck. Stop. You have to do the stop sharing and then once again you go to the sharing. And then you have to come. Seems like so. Sir? It's in, but Uh, slide show is not coming and slides are also not coming. Home, insert, design, animation, and other people. Slides are not coming. Slides are not coming. Slides are not coming. Slides are not coming. Slides are not Yes. Yes, sir. Resume. Yes, sir. Ah. Ah, 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 click on it. Yes. Yes. No scene, sir. Hello? Hello? Are you able to see 
ஸ்லைட் தெரியுது பட் ஸ்லைட் ஷோல வரல ஸ்லைட் மூவ் ஆக மாட்டேங்குது அடுத்த ஸ்லைட் போக மாட்டேங்குது சரி சூப்பர் சீன் ஓன்லி தி இன்ட்ரோடக்ஷன் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஸ்லைட் தே நாட் ஏபிள் டு மூவ் டு தி நெக்ஸ்ட் ஸ்லைட் அந்த அப் அண்ட் டவுன் ஏரோ இருக்கும் பாருங்க சார் அத கிளிக் பண்ணுங்க டவுன் ஏரோ கிளிக் பண்ணுங்க சரி சரி நாலு ஏரோ இருக்கும்ல சார் நாலு ஏரோ மாத்தி மாத்தி கிளிக் பண்ணுங்க மூவ் ஆகும் ஸ்லைட் மூவ் ஒரு <laughs> 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 திருப்பி நீங்க விண்டோ மட்டும் ஷேர் பண்ணிக்கிங்க கீழே அந்த 65% காட்டுது பாருங்க அது பக்கத்துல ஒரு சிம்பல் இருக்கு பாரு 65% கீழ கார்னர்ல அந்த ஜூம்ல 65% காட்டுது பாரு ஹோல் ஸ்கிரீனை ஷேர் பண்ணுமா இது மட்டும் பண்றாரு நினைக்கிறேன் ராமசாமி சார் எஸ் எஸ் கீழே 65% காமி இதுல பக்கத்துல ஒரு சிம்பல் இருக்கு பாருங்க அத கிளிக் பண்ணுங்க கிளிக் கிளிக் அத கிளிக் பண்ணீங்கனா ஸ்லைட் ஷோ வரும் சார் அங்க மிஸ்டர் சரவணன் இருக்கிற லிங்க்ல சார் அவட்ட ஒரு நிமிஷம் சொல்லுங்க சார் ஆ சரவணன் நீங்க ஒண்ணு பண்ணுங்க அந்த ஃபைல க்ளோஸ் பண்றீங்க அந்த ஃபைல க்ளோஸ் பண்ணிட்டு ஃப்ரெஷா ஓபன் பண்ணுங்க ஃப்ரெஷா ஓபன் பண்ணதுக்கு அப்புறம் ஸ்லைட் ஷோ கிளிக் பண்ணிட்டு அப்புறம் ஸ்கிரீன் ஷேர் பண்ணுங்க பெர்ஃபெக்ட்டா வரும் பண்ணுங்க இல்ல நேர மார்க்கிங் கொடுங்க ஸ்லை ஸ்லைட் ஷேர் போடுங்க அந்த 65 परसेंटेज பக்கத்துல பாருங்க ஒரு கிளாஸ் மாதிரி சிம்பல் இருக்கும் ஒரு ஒயின் கிளாஸ் மாதிரி அதை கிளிக் பண்ணுங்க ஆ அத தெரியுதா அங்க உங்களுக்கு தெரியுது நினைக்கிறீங்க இங்க தெரியல இல்ல ட்ட ஒன்னு பண்ணுங்க நீங்க எஸ்கேப் பண்ணிட்டு ஒவ்வொரு ஸ்லைடா அந்த நம்ம ஸ்லைட் பக்கத்துல 1 2 3 னே போங்க ஒன்னாஜிக்கல்ஸ்ட்ரானிக் <laughs> Recently, I had a very tough time with the case of strong subdural hematoma that I want to send this. A 65-year-old female has presented with history of headache, all present during vomiting for five days. On examination, patient was drowsy, arousable, confused with normal, stable vital signs with the left hemiparesis. 
So, uh, asking about the history of the patient, they attended told that there was no significant uh, trauma a few months back, but they told her that she had some uh, tribal trauma. At that time, patient was treated by a local GP. No uh, imaging was done at the time of uh, trauma. <clears throat> now, I have done a CT brain. You are able to see a right convexity chronic subclinical trauma with a gross midline shape. So, we have got a plan for emergency surgery. The basic blood biochemistry was supposed to be normal and the coagulation profile was also normal. <clears throat> so, the patient was uh, taken up for emergency barrel craniostomy with the evacuation of chronic cerebral hematoma. Surgery went uneventful. In the post op procedure, patient was become conscious, oriented, started taking oral feeds, and left positive also improved very well. So, we were planning for discharge on fourth uh, post op day. The patient has become drowsy, arousable, but developed again the left side weakness. So we have gone for follow-up CT brain. Unfortunately, the follow-up CT shows uh, post-operative changes along with residual and recurrent collection on the right convexity with mass effect and midline shift again. So in view of uh, recurrent and residual collection, the patient has been taken up for exploration after uh, convincing the patient attendance and explaining the, all the problems. I uh, have taken the patient for re-exploration. After opening the bar holes, we were not able to have any, any liquid hematoma during surgery. So hence, uh, the procedure has been converted into frontotemporal body craniotomy. See, after dural opening, uh, the entire surface has been uh, with uh, full of a mesh like uh, thick membrane, like a cushion like thing is seen after opening the dura. So the membrane was opened, subdermatum was evacuated, and brain also started. Surgery went uneventfully. <clears throat> and after second surgery, again. I was in very trouble because the patient remained rosy, was not able to obey in commands. In spite of all uh, IC management, patient was throwing recurrent seizures, even with the stiff dose of anticonvulsants, not even controlled with the lacosamide and the levetiracetam. So again, the follow-up safety brain was done. See how bad uh, the time for the surgeon and for the patient also. The follow-up safety brain shows the extensive Hyperdense subgalial and the subdural hematoma with the gross midline shift. The time very, very bad for me and also for the patient. In view of recurrent seizures, patient relatives are informed about the neurological status and the necessity for the re exploration. See, then I uh, patient underwent and proceeded with re exploration, evacuation of the subgalial hematoma, and uh, I have done bone, bone flap removal. And also, I removed the temporal muscle also this time. Luckily, after this third surgery, the post-operative picture, the patient became conscious and became ambulant also. <clears throat> so, this is a final CT scan. After all these things, the, there was no signal, no recurrent or residual collection. Ventricles has become a midline. Patient also has improved very well. And, uh, Discharge from the hospital. So, <clears throat> regarding the discussion, the chronic subclinical hematoma is one of the most frequent neurosurgical entities caused by the trauma. In most of the occasions, chronic subclinical hematoma mainly involves elderly patients. So because of this, this, uh, uh, this neurosurgical illness will be seen by both general practitioners as well as the special specialty doctors. See, despite the increasing prevalence of front cerebral hematoma, still in class 1 studies and evidence regarding the management of this is still lagging, it seems. If you see the statistics, in almost 77% of the cases, a patient will give the history of trauma, okay? In 41% of the cases, either the patient should have taken some oral anticoagulants or platelet with aggregation factors. The reported recurrence rate ranges from 2.3 to 33%. If you see the risk factors, the common is trauma. Everybody knows minor head injury in adults. Depends, sir. Trauma in the new net. Uh, brother. Hello.
Doctor, since the disturbance, I muted all. Kindly unmute yourself, doctor. I am requesting to speak, sir. I'll speak, doctor. Okay, sir. No. No. Yes, doctor. Request proceed, doctor. Yes, sir. So if you see the risk factors for chronic cerebrovascular the trauma is the main thing in adults and birth trauma in neonates and the advanced age using alcohol, recurrent seizures, intracranial hypotension followed by a shower shunting and coagulopathies. The patient is on taking an antiplatelet blood thinners and patient at the risk of falling. That is, a stroke patients with recurrent falls. It is other causes, rare causes are ocular malformations, including aneurysms and AV malformations and benign and malignant tumors and uh, infective uh, like meningitis and tuberculosis. <clears throat> see, the contributing factors, if you see, the most common is because of the cerebral atrophy in elderly patient and patients who are taking antiplatelets because of the coagulopathy, they may have recurrent bleeding. And patients who are taking alcohol, they may have repeated falls and increased estrogen level and coagulopathy and platelet dysfunction. So, there are many classification systems. In the radiological classification also there in chronic septal hematoma because each and everything will give indirect uh, evidence and indirect uh, guidance for the treatment. We can classify this chronic septal hematoma radiologically into homogeneous type, laminar type, separate, separated type and trapecular type. <coughs> This is a, you are able to see the different uh, densities of the chronic septal radiological classification because uh, indirectly you can assess the prognosis and the recurrence also by looking at these scans. See, if you see the pathophysiology of chronic septal we can evaluation of the chronic septal it may be initiation, provocation, and the resolution. <coughs> Regarding the pathophysiology, the, this entity of chronic cerebral hematoma was first described by Virtue in 1857. He named it as hemorrhagic on antenna, recognizing the inflammatory and hemorrhagic elements. See, one of our uh, uh, general surgeons used to say, when any surgical procedure, any surgical illness have different pathologies, pathophysiology, and different uh, kinds of modality of management, it, it is a trouble. Okay. <clears throat> okay. See, Regarding the subdural space, very important thing. This is a subdural space is a virtual space, which usually doesn't exist in healthy individuals, does not exist in healthy individuals, as the dura and arachnoid are tethered together by a layer of dural border cells. But when the aging with the increasing the age and with the increasing brain atrophy, the arachnoid is being pulled away from the dural layer, which remains attached to the skull. Sometimes resultant force stretches the dural border cell layer and veins traversing over it, that is, uh, bridging veins may be injured. Followed this, any minor the additional force, it, this may cause even these veins to tear, it may cause leakage of blood into the dural border cell layer and creating an acute subdural hematoma. <clears throat> so this is a picture showing this diametric representation of the pyometer and arachnoid layer, this is a dural border cell layer. See, there are many theories postulating the uh, pathophysiology of the chronic subglomatoma. So, one of the theory is osmotic theory, another one is oncotic theory. These two theories comes under propagation theory. Next one is microbleed theory, because in, in by this microbleed theory, the this uh, following as the lake a muscle layer, new capillaries for forming inside the new membrane, which are very fragile, followed by this. This lead on to repeated microbleed into the subdural space, which may cause increase in the hematoma volume. Next comes anticoagulant and the pro fibrinolytic therapy. Different studies have been shown that there will be acceleration of the fibrinolysis, which may lead on to high levels of tissue plasminogen activators and high concentration of fibrin degradation products within the subdural fluid. All these factors obviate the hemostasis within the subdural hematoma. The last thing is, this is inflammatory theory and the growth factor theory. This in, in, indirectly, it shows that the inflammatory etiology of chronic subdural hematoma. Inflammation leads on to high concentration of vascular endothelial growth factor. These factors within the hematoma 
lead on to increased promotion of the ongoing angiogenesis in hive and hyperpermeability in chronic cerebral hematomas see not all chronic cerebral hematomas are in progress okay 2.4 in 18 percent of chronic cerebral hematoma resolves spontaneously when the balance is in favor of coagulation cerebral hematoma organizes sometimes even lead on to calcification even if you see the presentation of chronic cerebral hematoma the presentation may be because of a clinical presentation may be in the elderly patients patient will be in elderly the onset is insidious onset because of the brain atrophy they are more liable for deficits because of altered cerebral blood flow and more cognitive defects in older children and adults the patient may have the features of raised intracranial pressure in infants you will be able to see you have to see the incidence is more with the 6 months to 1 year child we have to suspect child abuse in these cases <coughs> next this is a clinical classification they are classified into grade 0 to grade 4 starting from the asymptomatic patients to the grade 4 means a comatous patient with a flexion and abnormal flexion and extension to the painful stimuli we use many scoring systems for uh, uh, chronic cerebral hematoma one is uh, glasgow coma score cognitive scale if we see the management See, generally we see the any patient with neurological symptoms with radiological evidence of chronic cerebral hematoma should undergo immediate surgical evacuation but in a asymptomatic patient no evidence of brain compression no evidence of mass effect or midline shift and patient can be managed conservatively with periodic follow up and close neurosurgical monitoring regarding the the, the management may be a non surgical and surgical management <coughs> in non surgical management the people have tried with the, so many things like using steroids using tranexamic acid using mannitol all these things all these things are but inconclusive they are not helpful okay so points to highlight about the surgical management the preferred method is verbal craniostomy it's a best use best cure the next one thing is bedside twist drill craniostomy this can be done in high risk patients under local anesthesia <clears throat> okay and sometimes you may patient may need to go craniotomy the indications are chronic cerebral hematoma with significant membranes and uh, with acute shades with multiple recurrences and calcified cerebral hematoma all these things may require craniotomy there are many things as uh, a controversy whether to go for a single burgol or double burgol okay <clears throat> or not to irrigate regarding the irrigation no it may not not have any impact on morbidity and mortality it is unclear next question is whether to use drainage or not if you want to use drainage what kind of drainage you want to use whether it is a closed system drainage or subgaleal drainage and when will you that is we think that immediate post op mobilization may increase the recurrence rate but we may need on to complications of immobilization also other surgical methods are you can use ppa in addition to the twist drill craniostomy we can go for in, minimally invasive hematoevacuation using hollow screws the literature says so many procedure we may not do some uh, in our practice like subdural peritoneal shunts sometimes we can we may need small craniostomy endoscopic evacuation and another thing is you can try with the replacement of hematoma with oxygen via percutaneous subdural tapping and there are question about carbon dioxide insufflation with can be combined with verbal craniostomy and closed the system drainage we can do middle meningeal embolization in refractory cases of chronic cerebral hematoma we can even use implantation of omia reservoirs a neuro endoscopy still we can use the neuro endoscopy in uh, we can use in the multiple and uh, loculated chronic cerebral hematoma we can attempt with neuro endoscopy we can use flexible serial endoscope can be used if this is a minimally invasive technique we can run it through a single burgol as we know we cannot recommend for the acute cerebral hematoma 
regarding the recurrent chronic cephalometoma there is no definite consensus about the treatment so we have to search the underlying causes the common procedure for recurrent chronic cephalometoma we have to re explore as a burgol if necessary we convert into craniotomy other things rarely used is reservoir placement and the subdural pulverization and endoscopic techniques and subtemporal is morsification the post operative complication there are many things <coughs> failure to brain to expand following surgery and or reaccumulation of blood which happened to my case in the subdural space which may lead on to recurrent chronic cephalometoma and seizures including recurrent refractory seizures including recurrent status epilepticus following surgery we may have intracerebral hematomas and post operative infections and tension hemocephalus so the management of chronic cephalometoma still remains controversial in many things only few studies with class 1 evidence evaluating management protocols and surgical techniques exist currently several ongoing randomized controlled trials are going on next last thing is uh, definitive surgery as we do burgol craniostomy in symptomatic patient with radiological evidence okay what is the correct surgical method whether burgol craniostomy or craniotomy if you want to do burgol evacuation whether one single burgol or double burgol if you want to keep drain will you use drain or not if you want to use drain whether subdural drain or supraesophageal drain regarding and also irrigation of the hematoma with the saline when you will mobilize the patient in the post operatively and asymptomatic patients we can wait we can wait and watch policy can be adopted <coughs> so prospective multi center studies are providing type 1 recommendations are needed sir Thank you very much, sir. Sorry for the trouble, sir. So now we will go for the third question. Following our congenital disorder associated with craniovertebral junction instability, except A. Down syndrome, to Marquio syndrome, C. Vipagia disease, D. Osteogenesis imperfecta. So now we will go for the question and answer session. Those who have doubts, you can ask the questions. All of you, please unmute yourself. Good evening, sir. I'm uh, Dr. Christy Bernard, a resident from Stanley Medical College. Yes, uh, sir. I have a, we have a, we had a patient who had a thin uh, acute subdural hemorrhage in the right cerebral convexity, which was treated conservatively. The patient was on follow up, and after two months, persistent headache. We did a CT brain, a very thin acute subdural. 3 mm or 3 to 4 mm with no mid range shift, no mathrax. But the patient was having a persistent headache. Would you go? We had tried all analgesics, everything, but the, he was having severe excruciating headache, which was not settling down. Would you go ahead with the uh, patient was a young male, 30, 35 years male. Would you go ahead with the burrow and evacuation of such thin chronic SDH, or what? What other managements would have been done for that patient? In subdural hematoma, is there is there any radiological evidence of mass effect? No, sir. No mass effect was there. So, so thin subdural hematoma with no radiological evidence of mass effect or relationship. You yes, can still yes. try with conservative measures. Once if the patient is deteriorating or volume is increasing, or, or is there is a radiological evidence of mass effect or relationship, you can proceed with either burgol cranial burgol evacuation. Okay, okay. Even for thin ones, uh, the three mm, four mm ones, thin ones. 
it doesn't matter so you have to okay. come uh, correlate with the clinical finding Symptoms. and the radiological evidence okay 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 Hello. Yes. Sir, can you give a little input for the previous question that was just asked? Yes, sir. Srinivasan here. Yes, sir. Uh, for uh, nowadays, uh, for chronic subdural, a new modality of treatment, I think Dr. Ramasamy just also mentioned, is a medial meningeal artery embolization, which has been quite an effective treatment, especially for patients who are mildly symptomatic, like the one you asked, a thin subdural with a headache. Right after we embolize, their headache will vanish. And in about three to four weeks, you repeat a scan, the subdural will be completely gone. And then we also use this for patients who are all on anticoagulation and antiplatelet drugs. And in patients with liver failure, we use this as a primary modality. Uh, in patients who are symptomatic, obviously having an arm drift or a weakness, we still go with the surgical management of burr hole tapping or craniotomy and the membrane excision. So for your question, for your particular case, I would prefer to do a middle meningeal artery embolization. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, Rajesh, uh, a little bit uh, further to the same uh, question on the same case, uh, sometimes uh, steroid uh, works very well in these patients. So if they have not given steroids, a uh, three-week course of steroids and then repeat uh, the scan, some, the subdural just goes away. Even for moderate subdurals, I found that steroids work very well, especially those that come with residual uh, subdural after surgery. So they can try a course of steroid. So now, now we will go for the fourth question. Sir, I'm keeping all mute, sir. Sir, now it's visible, sir. Sir, kindly unmute and speak, sir. Sir, kindly admit and speak, sir. Question number four. What is the role of AED in chronic subdural hematoma? Okay, we can continue with the discussions. Any other dis questions? Any discussions? People can start. PGs, you can start asking questions and doubts.
There is a question from the chat box. Those who are online, you can come and ask the question instead of putting in the chat box. You are putting questions in the chat box. You can come and ask the questions. What is wrong in doing it? Please come, come and ask. On. Sir? Hello? Yes, Dr. Your voice is audible. Sir, uh, my voice... <laughs> I was having trouble, so I had to ask by chat box. Sorry, sir. Myself, uh, postgraduate from uh, Kwantra Medical College, sir. Uh, my, uh, my doubt is like we are following BTF uh, guidelines for trauma. So, chronic stage, I was uh, searching for uh, uh, guidelines uh, to apply, sir. So, I need, needed help uh, regarding that one, sir. Sir, I'm some, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Which guidelines to follow for chronic subdural hematoma? There is no definite guidelines. Sir. It's based on the clinical trial and the radiological evidence only, sir. Okay. See, most of the cases will improve with burgul tapping alone. See, the, the patient should be symptomatic and there should be a concurrent radiological evidence also. In such cases, you can treat the patient with burgul craniostomy. See, sometimes uh, you may have uh, multiple locations and uh, multi mul membranes. You may not uh, come out with, you know, patient may not improve with the uh, tapping. In such cases, we may need to go for a uh, craniotomy. Okay. So there should be both uh, clinical evidence and uh, the symptomatic patient and radiological evidence. You have to go with the surgical management. But as uh, Dr. Srini was told, it's very, very thin and uh, without any mass effect. Like we are, they are attempting to do middle meningeal or embolization, but we have not seen so far. And uh, otherwise, there is our dictum and our, our what we are following is the verbal tapping with the radiological evidence of mass effect and pillage. Yes, sir. Because we actually had a case, sir. Uh, he was a young male, about 23. He was known hemophilia patient, sir. He presented with uh, just uh, some mild giddiness. Uh, otherwise, uh, he had no weakness or headache or anything. But he had uh, more than 1.5 centimeter thickness of subdural hematoma with the shift of approximately 1 centimeter, sir. So our dilemma was whether to intervene at that point uh, or just stop. No, no. In, uh, in such cases, we have to wait with, uh, uh, based on the population profile, doctor, in this case. Similarly, also, sir, we had a 67-year-old old uh, lady, sir. She also came, incidentally found the chronic... Incident. Sir, ...observed mostly inactive like fall of CTs. See, in most of the cases, 15% of the will resolve the problem. See, at least... In order to prove these small means we can eat. Most of If there are no... Okay. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So Thank you for the... There was no winners. I answer for this Drake in 1978 as half and half approach is the answer. Um, no, uh, given the correct answer, so the prize is not given to the winners. The third question that was an easy question, I think. Following or congenital disorder associated with K C V junction instability, except. That is answer is page its disease. The winner is Vishnu Sankar. Vishnu Sankar from which college? Unmute yourself. Naga Vishnu Sankar. Hello, Naga Vishnu Sankar. Unmute. You are not audible here. Not audible. 
திருநெல்வேலி மெடிக்கல் காலேஜ் கங்கிராச்சுலேஷன்ஸ் யூ ஆர் நாட் ஆடுபிள் ஒன்னாஸ் <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jayachandran, alcoholic age more than 65 years, alcoholic persons and more than 65 years, Dr. Jayachandran, accidental opening of the inner membrane during surgery, alcoholic persons and age more than 65 years, uh, by Dr. Jayachandran. Dr. Jayachandran is available here. Dr. Jayachandran. Yes, sir. Doctor is here. Uh, sir. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Hello. Uh, Jai Chandran, you are from which college? Uh, sir, Tirnal Valley Medical College, sir. Huh? Tirnal Valley Medical College. Congratulations. So, two Thank winners you, from Tirnal Valley. Congratulations. Uh, yes. If there are no questions, it is now time for the vote of thanks by dr kodiswaran sir thank you all for joining us for this uh, thanks cme i would like to thank dr randit k murthy sir dr george jasper dr as ramesh sir dr sri ramachandra sir for wonderful lectures and hope uh, we will continue the same kind of cmes in coming months so thank you for joining us